Well, I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the pilgrim way for the hand of God in all my life I see. Oh, and the reason of my bliss, yes, the secret all is this, that the Comforter abides with me. Oh, He abides, He abides, hallelujah, He abides with me. And I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way, for the Comforter abides with me. And once my heart was full of sin, once I had no peace within, till I heard how Jesus died upon the tree. Then I fell down at his feet, and there came a peace so sweet, now the Comforter abides with me. Oh, he abides, he abides, oh, hallelujah, he abides with me for I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way for the comforter abides with me oh he is with me everywhere and he knows my every care I'm as happy as a bird and just as free for the spirit has control Jesus satisfies my soul the Comforter abides with me. Oh, He abides, He abides. Oh, hallelujah, He abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way. For the Comforter abides with me. And there's no thirsting for the thing of this world they've taken wings long ago i gave them up and instantly and all my night was turned to day all my burdens rolled away now the comforter abides with me oh he abides oh he abides hallelujah he abides with me Rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way for the comforter abides with. Well, he abides, he abides. Oh, hallelujah, he abides with me. For I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way for the comforter. heavenly home is bright and fair yes I feel like traveling on no pain or death can enter there yes I feel like traveling on oh yes I feel like traveling traveling on yes I feel Yeah.
want to keep traveling on with him amen he is my everything
let's all stand this morning. We have come into His house. We've gathered in His name. Oh, just worship Him this morning. Just raise your hands and worship Him. Oh, we have come into His house. Gathered. Forget about yourself. Oh, just forget about yourself. Just concentrate on Him and worship Just forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship God bless you. You can be seated for a minute. Amen. I'd like to start off the service this morning with a baby dedication. Amen. That's always a pleasure for the assembly to see what God has done. Brother Dry, if you and your wife would like to come forward and bring your new baby girl. God has been good, and we've got quite a few of these showing up this year. Amen. This little girl's name is Clarissa Bell Holsapple. Clarissa means clear and bright, and Belle means beautiful, amen? And may her life be clear and bright, amen. Praise the Lord, amen. Let's all bow our heads together. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for the blessing that you've given upon the whole Sapo family once more, to bless them with this little girl, little Clarissa Bell. And God, I pray that you would watch over her as we dedicate her to, her, to you. These parents bring her, Lord, as, a, as an act of showing that they believe that she came from you and they are stewards over this little life. May you just give them wisdom and leadership as they lead her. And God, may you lead her life every step of the way. Guard her, protect her, shelter her. 
May she always know you and may she feel your presence from the time she's a young child. And while she's yet young, may she give her heart completely to you and serve you all the days of her life. And may you be glorified in her life, we pray. As a church, we stand together with this family to help them, to support them, Lord, to raise this little life. We pray we do so in glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you, brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, musicians. Amen. While we're standing, let's turn to the, the book of Revelation, and we'll begin Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 7. This is the message to the Ephesian church age, and we're going to read uh, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You can have your seats. Amen. Now, we see the promise to the, at the end of the Ephesian uh, message to the Ephesian age. Verse 7 gives us a, a, the first promise and a series of promises. And it says, uh, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh. So there's a promise laying here, but the promise is only for a certain individual, and it's only for he that overcometh. Amen? This promise is not for everybody. This promise is for the overcomer. He says, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And I say, what a promise that is, amen? To, to eat of the tree of life means you're a partaker of eternal life. But that's only for the overcomer, praise God. Now, Brother Ram says in the message, how can I overcome? He says, watch what the overcomer is promised, see? Now, now, Laodicea, that's the last church age. There's going to be some overcomers in there. Watch there. They, now, remember, each, each church age, the one preceding it, inherits all that the other ones offered. So don't leave this in Ephesus because these promises are accumulative. So that's what he says. Each church age, the one preceding it, inherits all that the other ones offered. Watch up here now. It's after they done received all these powers, these names, and everything written that he promised, and eat the hidden man, and all down through, watching this last church age, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. So though these promises, now we're in the Laodicean church age, and uh, these promises are made available, all of the promises all the way down through are made available to us if we're overcomers, amen? So I wanna, I wanna minister this morning on how to overcome. If these promises are for overcomers, then I'd like to be an overcomer. Because if I'm an overcomer, I can eat of the tree of life and I can have all these, I can be a partaker of all these promises through the church ages. So I want to overcome. So the question is how to overcome, how, how to overcome. Let's, let's keep reading these promises as we go down through. Let's look at the Smyrna church age in chapter two, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Praise God. Verse 17, in the Pergamus church age. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh. If you're going to find there's a consistent theme here, let him that hath an ear to hear what the Spirit saith. So you have to be the type of person that has a special ear. And not everybody has this ear. Most all human beings, unless they have some deformity or birth defect, have ears. But this isn't the ears he's talking about. This is a special ear to hear what the Spirit says. So to be an overcomer and to have this promise, you have to be able to hear, amen, you have to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. And then to him that overcometh. Will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. Now the Thyatira church age, verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule, 
He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Sardis, church age, verse, chapter three, verse five. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Philadelphia church age, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith into the churches. And now the Laodicean church age in verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sit down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I don't know about you, but I want all of those. I want the white robe, I want the white stone with a new name. I want written on me the name of, uh, of God, I want written on me the name of New Jerusalem, and I want revealed to me Jesus' new name. I want to eat of the tree of life, I want, I want a white robe, I want all of the things that are promised, I want them all, and they're all available if I have an ear to hear what the Spirit saith, and I am an overcomer. So we must be overcomers to inherit this. We have to have an ear to hear. That's predestination, amen? And we have to be an overcomer, amen? That's also predestinated. Praise God. Amen. I tell you, there's such a, there's such a power in re the revelation of predestination. How do I know I will overcome? I've been predestinated to overcome. Amen. But it's still, God is in partnership with man. It still requires us in a surrendered way, amen, to surrender to God's program for the overcoming to come into manifestation. I'm already ordained to overcome, amen. God already knows the, the end from the beginning. He knows what the finish will be, amen. But I've got to get with his program and surrender and yield to his program to see the manifestation of the overcoming. So if you've got an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, you should be rejoicing, amen? amen. Praise God that I can actually hear. I, I, I'm in a generation, amen, where these, this word has been, this book has been opened, this word has been revealed, and I hear it and I believe it and, it, and, and it, and it makes sense to me, and I love it, and I want it. When millions don't, I do. God has given me an ear to hear what the Spirit says. And now I want to be that overcomer that inherits the com cumulative prize of all the church ages. He says, now, we, in, the, in the Laodicean, he says, he that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also come and sit down with my father in his throne. Brother Branham in the church age book, he says, see, it's not on throne, it's in throne in my throne, in my Father's throne, not on a throne. He said, this is not a seat. This is a position of power in the kingdom. The throne is the entire realm of the kingdom, amen? It's the inheritance, it's, it's the, the rural jurisdiction, it's, it's the full territory of God and Jesus Christ, amen? And he says, when I, if you overcome in this last age, amen, in the Laodicean church age, if you have a hear, ear to hear what the Spirit says in this age, and you that overcometh in this age, I will give you to sit it, with me in my throne, amen? That means you'll sit in the kingdom in a power of position and authority with him in the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise be to God. Amen, it's more than a seat. It's the whole realm of Christ. Amen. In the church age book, in the Laodicean church age, Brother Bram says, now what are we to overcome? He had just read this uh, the scripture that we read in Revelation 3.21, he says, now what are we to overcome? That's wonderful. I've looked at this so many times in, 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 in our age in Laodicea. What is it that we're to overcome? But listen to how Brother Ben puts a twist on this. 
Now, what are we to overcome? That is the normal question to ask here, right? If you're an overcomer, you can get this prize. What do I overcome? Where's the dragon I must slay? Where's the hill I must climb? Where's the race I must win? And Brother Branham says, this is the normal question to ask here. But that is not the actual thought of this verse. For it is not so much what we are to overcome, but how we are to overcome. Now this is logical, for it doesn't, doesn't matter much what we are to overcome, as long as we know how we can overcome. Amen. You can say, what do we overcome in this last age? We can list a whole list of things. We overcome unbelief. We we overcome deception. We overcome, we can make a whole list of what do we overcome in the Laodicean church age. But Brother Bram said, that's not really the important part. That's not the emphasis of the scripture. Amen. Because it doesn't matter what you need to overcome. The method is always the same. If you know how to overcome, you will overcome every obstacle. So the question that needs answered is how to overcome, not what to overcome. Don't worry. The world will supply the what. We need God to give us the how. And when we have the how, no matter what the enemy throws as the what, we can overcome the what with the how. So I don't, I don't care so much about the name of the what, what to overcome. Name it anything you want to name it, but if God will reveal to me how to overcome, amen, then it doesn't matter what I'm overcoming, the same method will always overcome and conquer. He goes, it, it goes on to say in the same quote, a quick look at those scriptures which involve the Lord Jesus overcoming will bring out the truth of this proposition. In Matthew 4, wherein Jesus is tempted of the devil, he overcame the personal temptation of Satan by the word and by the word only. In each of the three major trials that corresponded exactly to the temptation of the Garden of Eden, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Jesus overcame by the word. He fell to the personal temptation of Satan by failing to use the word. Catch that. Eve failed. She fell in her personal temptation by failing to use the word. Adam fell in direct disobedience to the word. But Jesus overcame by the word, and right now let me say that this is the only way to be an overcomer. Also, it is the only way that you can know if you are overcoming because the word can't fail. Oh, I love this last sentence, and we're going to spend a minute on this. Amen. Uh, The the only way to be an overcomer is by the word. But it's also the only way that you can know that you're overcoming because the word can't fail. So you can't tell whether you're overcoming or not by how well you're performing or behaving. Amen. Amen. Because we go through cycles in life, amen? Things cycle and and we have our ups and our downs, amen? And we cannot always gauge whether or not we're overcoming by what's happening in our lives, amen? The only way we can know we're overcoming is if we're standing solely upon the word. And if we're standing solely upon the word, it doesn't matter what turmoil we're in in the middle of our lives, we are overcoming because the word can't fail. You say, I'm applying the word, but everything's going wrong. You're overcoming, hold steady. You're overcoming right now by saying, I believe the word regardless of symptoms, regardless of circumstances. This is the word and it's the only thing for me. Amen, you're overcoming right now today and you could be going through the worst situation of your life, but you are currently overcoming. And that is the only way to know that you're overcoming. Because you can't, you know, wake up in the morning and feel pretty good and there's no symptoms, no troubles, I got a job, there's money in the bank, everything's fine, I'm overcoming. That's no sign you're overcoming. Amen. And so whether we're in a trial or not in a trial, there's no sign whether we're overcoming. The only way to know if we're overcoming is by staying with the word and the word only. This is becoming such a critical message. Amen, I can't get beyond preaching on these things. Amen, because, uh, uh, you know, 
I don't know why, it's just the way God's leading me, but as I meditate on this, there's so many things that we try to do and try to produce and we try to be stronger and we try to do better and, and we always try to guard ourselves and protect ourselves and reform ourselves and all of this stuff and we end up continually in a cycle of, of failure and uh, disappointing ourselves and we gotta get our eyes off of ourselves and start focusing on the word that is God, give, God has given us and stick with that word and overcome by the word and stop injecting self into the picture because that's the miserable failure to begin with. Amen. So I cannot lean on self, rely on self, depend on self. I've got to get self out of the picture and say, regardless of myself, this word is true. Amen. Amen. And I'm standing with this word all the way to the finish line, regardless of what happens. That's the only way to know if you're overcoming because the word can't fail. When I read that, something lit up inside of me and said that's the deception of the age to get us to base our experiences with the Lord off of emotions because emotions are so fickle. I'm an overcomer today, I'm a failure tomorrow. I'm a failure today, I might be an overcomer tomorrow. If I'm an overcomer tomorrow, I may only be an overcomer for an hour tomorrow then I'm not an overcomer anymore. But this promises to the overcomer, it's not something to play with. I have to know how to be an overcomer because I believe these promises are for me and I want all of the promises, I want to apprehend them all, so I'm not going to play around with this. This is something I have to know is how to overcome. Amen. The devil will absolutely play games with you emotionally. And if we're depending on willpower or emotion to gauge our level of overcoming, amen, we are going to find ourselves miserable, frustrated, and constantly, uh, constantly questioning our sonship, yes. our faith, right. our brideship. Yes. But we base all of these things on the word. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> and uh, further down in the Laodicean church age, he says, in his own personal life, contending with himself, he's talking about Jesus now. He's speaking of Jesus Christ. In his own personal life, contending with himself. He overcame by obedience to the word of God. Jesus was contending with himself. Amen, where? In the Garden of Gethsemane, we can see it clearly and plainly. If Jesus had to contend with himself, what do you think you and I have to do? It says he overcame by obedience to the word of God. And then Brother Branham goes to Hebrews chapter five, verse seven. It says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. What was he obedient to? The word of God. So he suffered, he yielded himself, he overcame by obeying the Father and yielding to the word, and that's how he contended with himself and overcame himself, amen? It, it's not as though Jesus didn't anymore despise the cross. It's not that he prayed in Gethsemane till all of a sudden he was no longer despising the cross or despising the shame of the cross. It was no longer that he didn't love his disciples anymore and he no longer had a feeling for them and didn't want to leave them. Amen. I, I believe he still had his desire to stay with his disciples. I believe he still had love for them and concern for them. I believe he still despised the shame of the cross. But he had overcome himself to yield himself to the will of God, to obey the word of God, and that was his overcoming, that was his victory. What was he obedient to? The word of God. Now then, there will not, listen closely, now then, there will not be one person who will sit in the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ unless he has been living that word. Your prayers, your fastings, your repentances, no matter what you present to God, none of that will gain you the privilege of sitting in that throne. It will be granted only to the word bride. 
As the throne of the king is shared with the queen because she is united to him, so only they who are of that word, even as he is of that word, will share that throne. Amen. It doesn't matter how loud you say it. What matters is if you live it. It doesn't matter how boldly you proclaim, I'm this and I'm that and I'm... What matters is if you stay surrendered to that word and you overcome by the word and the word only. Praise God. In the message, how can I overcome from 1963, it says, Lord Jesus, he said, an hour and 15 minutes now standing here trying to take your word and explain to the people how to overcome. You told us how it's done. You didn't tell us, but you showed how it was done. You led us. You showed us how to do it. Receive the word inside of us and be sure to hold to that word. Be sure to hold to that word. It is written in every temptation, but be humble and walk humbly. Then we have conquered through you, through your power, which has already conquered our enemy. And the only thing we have to do is just walk humbly with, humble with faith, believing that and our badge of identification of the Holy Ghost, and Satan has to move. So Brother Ben's giving us directions. He's giving us a recipe, and he's praying. He's praying out to the Lord. He's saying, Lord, you showed us how to do it. You didn't just tell us, but you showed us, and with it is written, amen? So we have to receive the word inside of us and hold to it is written in every temptation, but be humble and walk humbly. This is the recipe. This is how Jesus lived. Then we have conquered through you, through your power, which has already conquered our enemy. We're just tapping into the same power when we come humbly submissive to the word. We're tapping into the same power that overcame the first time will overcome this time because I'm coming to the same thing the same way. I'm coming to the same source, getting in the same channel with the same humble, uh, humility, the same reverence, the same surrender, amen, and then I'm tapping into the same power that overcame back there, will overcome today because I'm coming the same way. Praise be to God. Let's turn to Matthew chapter four. We've been through this several times together, but I wanna take a look at it again. Matthew chapter four, verse one. It says now, chapter four, verse one of Matthew. It says, then was Jesus led up, led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of a temple and saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels come and ministered unto him. Amen. Brother Frank, if you could pull up the whiteboard for me, I'm gonna use that here in just a second. Brother Bam has a quote here in the message, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, from 1958. He says, now, we find him as soon as God came upon him, he was anointed, went into the wilderness, and out after 40 days, and defeated Satan by the word of God. What did he do? He brought any divine promise in reach of the weakest of Christians. If he was God, why did he let Satan say, if thou be the son of God, perform a miracle here and show me you can do it. Turn these stones into bread and eat. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So then as Satan always tries to coat the word, 
I, I love how Brother Bram says that. He doesn't say quote the word. He knows what he's saying. He coats the word, amen? He puts a little coating on it and changes it a little bit, amen? And he, and he does it intentionally, Brother Bram said. Satan always tries to coat the word and went back and told him when he put him at the pinnacle of the temple, he said, again, it is written, he defeated Satan on the word of God. That shows that you can defeat Satan on the word of God no matter. The word of God will defeat Satan any place, anywhere, under any condition. If it's in the belly of a whale, if it's in a lion's den, if it's on the bed with a cancer, or if it's laying yonder bleeding to death in an automobile accident, the word of God will defeat Satan anywhere, and the weakest Christian can use it. It's your God-given privilege to do it. Praise God. Amen. We've went through this before and taught on this, but something new opened up in this message, how can I overcome? And, and I want to look at that in addition to what we've seen before. So when we look at the temptation, amen, of Eve in the garden, Jesus had to overcome the same three types of, of, of temptations. And this is, this is uh, uh, if I can mark it this way, these are three, oh, I'm going to come down here. These are three personal temptations and it has to do with our flesh. The one is the lust of the eyes. Two, the lust of the flesh. And three, the pride of life. Brother Bram's going to show us everything works in threes. And when he come to this next one, I got really excited because I'd never seen this before. Or the one I'm going to get to, not the next one. So it's personal temptation in the flesh was tempted by the lust of the eyes, by the lust of the flesh, by the pride of life. These are things we have to face and we have to overcome. Eve failed to overcome them because she failed to use the word. If she would have just used the word, and she didn't have a complicated word. The word was simple. Do not touch. It was simple. Don't partake of that tree. It wasn't complex. It wasn't complicated. If she would have just used the simple word she had, but it became complicated when it filtered through human reasoning, and she began to wonder about things and question things. Instead of just simply using the simple word, the simple word would have overcome the devil. You know, the devil comes so sophisticated sometimes, amen, and so uh, when, when we're dealing on the level of reasoning, it becomes so tricky and so slippery and, and, and so complicated and complex at times, amen, but if we could just ever get back to the simplicity of the word and say, I don't understand what you're saying and I, I can't put all these pieces together, but I know the word says this and I'm going to stay right here, amen. it would be a lot better for us. All right, then there was three things, three things we must not do with the word. So these go together because Satan does all three of these in the temptation to Jesus. Number one, to miss, interpret the word. You, should, you must not misinterpret the word. Two, you must not misplace the word. And three, you must not dislocate the word. And in these three things, when he goes to misinterpret the word, he says, thou shalt not dash thy foot against the stone. He begins to quote the word to Jesus, thou shalt not dash thy foot, amen, but he's misinterpreting even the meaning of that scripture. Right. It doesn't even mean that. It's not even referring. He's telling, he's telling him to go up on top of the pinnacle and throw himself off to force God to save him. That's not even what that scripture is talking about. And so the devil will try to misinterpret the word. He'll try to misplace it. He'll try to have Jesus, amen, making food for himself in the wilderness, but that's not the placing. There's going to be another time for that and another setting. 
And he tries to get him to dislocate the word by telling him to take the kingdom now. But that scripture, that part of the, of the prophecy doesn't fit now. It'll fit later. Amen. When he comes to return as son of David to set up the kingdom in the millennial reign. So it's part of the word, but it's a dislocation of the word. All right. And so when he, he tries to get him by misinterpreting the word, by misplacing the word, by dislocating the word, and he gets him by the, tries to tempt him by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. This is such an education for us if we'll pay attention because the same thing happens to us all the time. He's going to try to trip us up by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. He's going to try to get us to misinterpret the word, to misplace the word, or to dislocate the word. And so we have to be, we've seen the devil's tactics, amen? And so the, the, the devil's tactics, I, I love it. The devil comes three ways to tempt your flesh. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. He comes with three tactics in the word to try to misinterpret, misplace, or dislocate. But Jesus always responds with one method, one weapon. The sword of the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It is always, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. So the devil will try three different ways, amen, three different methods, and, and Jesus always has one response, and that one response is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. So for us, we only have one response. Yes, sir. If we really want to have victory and be an overcomer, amen, we have to take the word with a strong hand of faith, amen, and drive it to the heart of the enemy with it is written, the word says, the prophet taught, this is what God taught us in this day. And if we'll take that and stand on it, amen, we will be an overcomer and we will know that we are overcoming because we're overcoming by the word. So, so whatever method we wanted to use for overcoming in the past, let's throw it away and take the overcoming that comes by overcoming by the word, regardless of the circumstances. God will change the circumstances. I don't have control over the circumstances. If I had control over the circumstances, I would change them. If you have control over the circumstances and don't change them, then there's something wrong with you. But the things we face, we cannot control. We cannot change in our own power. We're depending on God to change them. I cannot force him to change them. I cannot tell him how to change them. I cannot bully God and pressure him into doing something according to my thinking. I got to come humbly with the word and let God do what he's going to do. But I have to have absolute confidence that God will do it if I just stay with his word and let him work it out the way he said he would work it out. It's not my problem to fix now. I've taken his word. Now he has to fix it. Amen. How many of you have given God advice on what to do to solve your problems? God, I have this problem and I need you to do this. And how many times has you solved your problem, but he didn't do what you said to do. He did something else, and it worked out a lot better. <laughs> I think he's training us. He wants us to understand how to be an overcomer, how to be a real overcomer. Now, Brother Branham got into three more things here that I, I want to go into. We've taught on all this before, but this one was, was new. I saw this for the first time myself. And the message, how can I overcome he says, his 40 days of temptation by God's word he overcome. I want to express something here just for a few minutes. Satan made three major assaults upon him in the temptation. Three major assaults. Amen. Watch it, always in them three. Don't forget it. He made three major assaults from the highest to the lowest. He tried his best to conquer him, but he was the word, amen. What did he use? Himself, the word. What did Christ use? He used himself. The word. <laughs> Satan's three major attacks or assaults upon him, but he met it with the word. Every attack, he could make it with the word. Watch this now from the highest to the lowest. He goes on, he says, now first he made his attack upon to use his great power, which he knowed he was the word. He knowed his position. You believe he did? This I, the son of man, he knowed his position, and Satan come and wanted him to use his own power on himself to feed him, want to feed himself. He was hungry. A man gets hungry. He can do almost anything. He'll steal, rob, beg, borrow anything. He had that appetite. Remember, we have to understand that Jesus was 100% man. 
and 100% God. When he, after 40 days when he was fasting, and it says afterward he was a hungered, he was hungry. Very, very hungry. Amen. And so now the temptation comes. He had that appetite, and Satan used his first great major assault upon him to make his own power that he had been given to overcome with and use it on himself. He didn't use it on himself. No, he used it on others. That's right. He used it on others, not himself. It wasn't for him. Though he could have done it, he certainly could have done it. So let's look at this next round. So these are three errors. He called them three great assaults, three errors in applying the word. All right? So he tried to tempt him with lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Tried to misinterpret the word, misplace the word, dislocate the word. And he also tries to get him to err in the application of the word. I love how Brother Branham can bring so much out of a passage of Scripture. First, in the, in the error, the first thing he does is to use his power. Oh, forgot the R. You have no idea what kind of pressure it is to write in front of school teachers and good spellers. And the first was he tried to get him to use his power for himself. And Jesus wasn't given this position for himself. He was given this position for others. Remember, Brother Branham would be praying for people and so sick he could hardly stand, gripping the sides of the pulpit just to stay up, and people being healed of cancer, deaf uh, ears opening, but he himself was so sick he could hardly stand up anymore. He said, the gift wasn't for me, it was for you. And Brother Ben was so faithful, even in the messy standing in the gap, when he began to pull back because of hurt feelings. Amen. He, he said, I let the sick people lay. I had a gift of healing to take to the people, and I let them lay. And he found that he was, he was withholding, and he was wrong for doing that. He had to get his gift back out to the people because the gift was given for the people. And, and that's why Jesus came. He came to redeem. He came to save. He came with great power to overcome. But the devil tried to get him to use it on himself under the lust of the flesh to make food for himself. He was trying to get him to use it in a carnal, temporal way. Because God's program is eternal, amen? God, he came for an eternal purpose. He came for a word purpose, for an eternal purpose, and the devil was trying to get him to use his power for a temporal, carnal, amen, satisfaction of the flesh, amen, to get him out of a, a tight spot or, or a difficult situation, amen, and that was never what that gift and power was for. And Jesus didn't take the bait because it was a wrong application of the word. One, God never told him to do it, amen. And, and, and two, it wasn't for him anyways, it was for everybody else. Right, praise God. That's why, you know, we can have all these gifts, but what good is it for God to give us a gift and us hide it under a bushel basket and us to have a gift and, and we just, we don't want to get out there because, you know, I, I've been rejected before. I've been criticized for singing. I got rejected when I did this and, and all of this. Listen, that gift is not for you to stay home and enjoy in your private study or your private life. If God gave you a gift or a calling or an office in the church, it's to be out for everyone else. It's not for you to enjoy as you read the word and the word opens to you because God's given you a gift of ministry. Amen. And that's not for you. That's for the people. God's given you a gift to sing, a gift of writing songs. He's given you a gift of administration, a gift of helps. Amen. That's not for you to enjoy for your own personal life and benefit. That's for others. God gave that for the body. Amen. 
And Jesus came for the rest of the body, amen. And was he hurt? Yes. Was he mocked? Yes. Was he ridiculed? Yes. Amen. Was he rejected? Yes. And if you go and give, give yourself wholly, amen, to serve the Lord and to serve his people with what he's put inside of you, you will be misunderstood, rejected. You will be, everything under the sun will happen to you, amen. Not even intentionally sometimes people will reject you or, or criticize you. You'll get your heart stomped on over and over again, but it's no right to hold that gift to yourself and use it only for you. It didn't come for you, it came for the body. And Jesus passed that temptation. How can I overcome? Again, further down he says, uh, he says, then the second assault, he said, I'll hurry, it just looks like the time just goes so fast. The next great assault was that he made upon him that he would be a show off. And how that does hit God's servants to be a show off, to show what you can do. Glory to God, hallelujah, I'm a deliverer, I'm so, see, see, come up here on top of the temple and sit down here. He tempted him to do it. Now remember, he was tempted to do it hard, said, now if you want to be something before the people, stand up here on this temple, jump off, and I'll give you a scripture for it because it's written. He'd give the angels charge over thee. We know that the, that's a mis, uh, misplacement of the scripture, a misinterpretation of the scripture. But he gave him a scripture nonetheless. Amen. I, I'll tell you something for sure. That devil's so slick that if, if you've got something in your heart you want to do, for wrong reasons, for fleshly self-pride, for the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and you want to do it anyways, rest assured the devil will show you a scripture or a quote that will give you license to go do that. And if you're not really honest looking at it, it will be a misapplication of a quote, a misplacement of a scripture, but you'll do it anyways because it already fulfills something you want inside. Look at Eve. Eve, she was beguiled, she was deceived. She was deceived because she wanted to be deceived. Yeah. Brother Bram said she didn't know about this mystery of uh, replenished the earth, but she wanted to know. Yeah. She had a desire to know, amen, but the information was held back for a period of time. The mystery wasn't unlocked yet, and she wanted to know, amen. She didn't know, but she wanted to know. So when the devil came, and, uh, when the serpent came to her, he began to entice her with this information, amen, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God's doing good and evil. He gave her a way to know. She wanted to know. Was she deceived? Yes. But she already wanted to know. So listen, here you have people walking through the Garden of Eden where she can walk with her mate, Adam, who is a prophet. She can walk with him. She could have waited and asked Adam. And in the cool of the evening, God came to walk in fellowship with his children. She could have asked God the Father, but she didn't go to Adam. She didn't go to God, amen, because she was being tempted in something she already wanted to do and wanted to know. And so he gave her an answer, a solution, a way to have her own desire. Oh, I tell you, friends, the, the hardest person in the world to overcome is ourselves, the one that we look at in the mirror. And if we're ever going to overcome selves, we have to start being really honest with ourselves. We've got to get down to nitty-gritty and say, you know what? That's just me because that's what I want to do. I'm trying to make it work out for me. I'm interpreting all the little signs, you know. I want to go do this thing, and, and I've got a little bit of a check in my heart, a little bit of conviction about wasting that money or wasting that time or doing this. So I'm going to watch for God to give a sign, and all of a sudden, somebody else said that, and I'll, look at this, it connects with this, and, and I walked through the store, and I saw in the newspaper that same word. It sounds ridiculous, but that's exactly what we do. It's exactly what we do. Instead of just saying, God, this is what I want, but I don't know that it's what you want. I need a real answer. It's amazing how dishonest we are with ourselves. But the, the funny part is, deep down we know. But up here we convince ourselves 
when down here we're not sold? Or maybe I'm the only one who does that. But I can explain it thoroughly to you because I've been through it numerous times. Down here, there's a little check, a little no. But up here in the reasoning realm, I want to. It's not sin. You can't say it's sin. I want to do this, but down here there's a little no, but I will reason and reason. And then all, if I can find where the prophet did it, where, see, he went fishing. I can abandon these duties and go fishing. If I can find where the prophet did it, or I can find some, 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 something to give me just that little edge, that little push in my reasoning mind, amen, to get over this nagging feeling. I'll go down that path and, and think that I've got an answer from the Lord, but deep down in your heart, you already know. I don't know how we can go on being the bride of Jesus Christ unless we start being really real. Really real all the way down to the core of our persons and stop playing games in our mind and stop playing games with the word and stop playing games with ourselves. But get down to the nitty gritty and say, this is here I am, Lord. This is what I've done. God, forgive me. And lead me and let me stay in your word because he'll try to give you a word that will allow you to do what you already want to do. And you know what? God will let him to prove what's in our hearts. And every once in a while, we need to fall and bump our nose real hard to realize that I still need God and I still need to be honest with God. And I'm still in fallen flesh and I'm still in a corruptible body with a corruptible mind and I need to feed the white dog and I need to stay close to Christ and I need to line to this word if I ever hope to overcome in this world. Amen. So number two... is to exalt self. Number two is to exalt self. He wanted to make him a show-off to show his authority. I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue in this quote, but I want to throw in a couple other thoughts Brother Branham has from other messages. In Harvest Time, he says, Satan, Satan ever had, even then, watch in this one place here, he coded the word. Even on his supernatural that he tried to get Jesus to do, the supernatural, see, being having supernatural, what if Jesus would have listened to him? Now wait, you want to stay with the word, do you? You want to stay with the word? He said, it's written. He'd give his angels charge concerning this. Anytime you dash your foot against a stone, they bear thee up. But he wasn't dashing his foot against no stone. But I'm saying, it's a misapplication, misinterpretation of the word. That word was if he would dash his foot against stone. He wasn't dashing his foot against the stone. Amen. See, watch. What if he would have to say, stay, stayed with it? Did you notice? I never said he quoted the word. He coded it, coded it like putting an icing on a cake, covered it over, whitewashed it. It wasn't in its right place. So he quoted the word to Jesus, but it was a misplacing, misinterpretation of the word, amen, to get him, amen, to do something to exalt himself. And how can I overcome? He says, but see how the devil gets? The devil wants you to mind him. He minded only what the father said do, that's right. He said, why? Satan said, it's written. He'd give the angels charge. He said, yes, but it's also written. There you are, see, he knew who he was, Satan did. The, now listen to what Brother Brown says, the thought runs deeper than what it's wrote. He's talking about the scriptures. Yes, he used the scripture, but there's something deeper. You're, you're taking it on a service level and misusing the word. It's got a deeper meaning and there's a deeper understanding. He said the thought runs deeper than what it's wrote. It's, in, it's inspiration. The kernel is on the inside of it. You see what it really is. Though he could have done it, he didn't do it. He had never paid heed to Satan's proposition. There he... <clears throat> here is a good thing. Sometimes Satan can take you, and when you think that you're doing the will of God and can make you a proposition, you'll fall for it. Fall for it. Yes, sir, he sure can. Amen. And Brother Remember was showing us that it's the word, but it's the word 
It's the word misplaced. It's the word misinterpreted. Yes, the scripture says that. But that, it's not this application. Yes, the word says that. <clears throat> but Brother Branham said, see, it's the thought that's deeper than what's wrote. If we're not going to survive just if we have a surface level being able to read. We need, amen, the word on the inside. We need the interpreter of the word. Amen. We need the life of the word on the inside so that when these things come up, you can say, but that's not, that's not exactly right. But it's a quote. Yeah, it's a quote, but it's not. There's something more to that. Amen. Something inside says there's something more to that. Amen. And then if you go to look, you'll find another quote, another quote, another quote. Amen. That tells you really what you ought to do. And this one's a misplacing of what the brother Branham said or taking it out of context or taking it out of sequence. And do the same thing with the word. Amen. Somebody will give you a, a, a justification for what they do, a justification for what they want you to do. Amen. But you've got to have that kernel on the inside that can connect to what's deep in the word, has to connect what's deep inside of you. You'll never win this battle in the mental realm. You'll fail every time because the devil will whip you around mentally. But it's going to take the life of the word on the inside to recognize the word with the right life. Praise be to God. So don't be so quick when somebody throws a quote and your heart's still saying no. Little bell going off, ding, 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 but somebody's got a quote. Don't ignore that. But I tell you too, unless you're sure, don't contradict what they're saying. Just wait, don't pass any judgment. Don't, because sometimes you get a little ding, ding inside and you don't really know what it is. It might be because that's right. It might be because it's wrong. Don't throw it away. Just don't say anything. Just wait and wait for God to bring a revelation out of the word that shows you what's right and what's wrong. Amen. Amen. This is rubber meets the road preaching, amen? This is life. This is not surface life. This is deep life. This is a bride life. This is not a denominational life. This is not a church life. We're talking about a child of God life. Amen. The, the world, amen, has made church a system. The world has made church a program, and you plug into the system, you plug into the program, and you're fine. Amen? And so they, the, 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 the devil is trying to turn the message in many people's minds into the same thing, just the best program, and if I plug into the best program, I'll be right if I pass through the best program. And I'll tell you, the message is the best, but it's not a program. It's a person. It's a person who wants to connect with you individually, personally, and bring the life of that person into you so that you can live this word. Amen. It's not the best program out there. It's not the best system. It's not the one that will finally work. If we take it as a program, if we take it as a system, it'll never work for us because we can only take it as a life. Amen. But the devil's trying the same tactics he's always tried. Just get people to plug into a program somewhere. And they'll say, I'm in the message. I'm in the message, therefore I'm okay. That, that doesn't compute. That's denominationalism. I'm in the message. It's like, you know, I, I, why are you doing that? And I don't understand this. And didn't the prophet say, I'm in the message. I, I don't know. That doesn't work for me. Amen. I want to be in Christ, and I want Christ in me. I want to live by this word and this word only. I don't want to come into these temptations and, and face the devil, amen, not knowing where I stand and having no personal Christ on the inside, no Holy Ghost, amen, to lead and guide me and come into a mental battle with the devil. It's not going to work. Back to the, back to the quote in um, where we were reading, I don't remember. No true servant of God ever does that. He's talking about showing off now. You see a man showing off his chest out and all like that, just remember there's something wrong there. 
If, if somebody starts to take a gift, take an ability, take a talent, and begins to uh, uh, exalt themselves and become proud in that, there's something wrong there. It's not right. There's something wrong there. Amen. And the, the prophet of God is so clear to teach us that, and not just to teach us that, but demonstrate that for us. I, have you ever seen a more gifted human being in all of your life? But he was so humble. Brother Bram didn't, didn't play games, didn't show off. And even when he, when he allowed his campaign managers to create the miracle line, you know, he was warned not to do it, but he let them do it again. Bring your worst cases, bring the miracle line. There'll be, and the, the managers were saying guaranteed healings every night. Amen. And when Brother Bram didn't stop that, when he was supposed to stop that, all of a sudden in the, in the prayer line, the gift would not work in the prophet of God. And it wasn't working and it scared him to death. And he went to pray. Amen. And he realized he made his mistake because God doesn't want that kind of showmanship. He doesn't want that kind of, I guarantee miracles every night. Amen. How can you guarantee, amen, what you're depending on God to do as if it's linked to you somehow and you have control? I guarantee, amen, uh, uh, and then say healings, guaranteed healings every night, miracle line, bring your worst cases, amen, and, and God tolerated that in, in a season of ignorance, and there was great healings and great miracles, but when he corrected it, he allowed the campaign managers to keep doing it, and God showed who was in charge when he lifted the operation of that gift from that prophet, and it did not work, and it, and it absolutely tore up the prophet of God. He went in desperation because he prayed for a girl that had barely had any hearing. And when he prayed for her, I haven't read it recently, so I may have it wrong, but I believe it goes, she was having problems hearing and he went to pray for her and she went completely deaf. That it got worse, not better. And then went for another one and the same kind of thing happened and he stopped and he went back in prayer in desperation, amen. And God was teaching the prophet a lesson that he had to learn. This is not you, this is me, amen. You're, you listen, you and I are not in control of God. God's in control of us, amen. Praise God. Oh, this is a lesson to learn, friends. So, so much nonsense about I'm the bride and I can do in this puffed up arrogant attitude. Amen, if you, if you have a revelation that you're the bride, it should bring such humility, such reverence because you know there's no way you're capable of it, you're not worthy of it. Amen, left to yourself, you will ruin everything God ever tried to do in you, that you are the worst of the worst of the worst, but it's by his grace he has made you bride and it's by his hand he does anything worth doing in your flesh, is done by him. So this attitude of I'm the bride, amen, and, and I, can, I can continue to dress in the way the prophet told us not to dress. I can dabble with makeup. I can I wear excessive jewelry, tight clothes and high heels and put a TV back in my house and we can let marriage and divorce issues run rampant through the church because I'm the bride. You've got a wrong attitude and a wrong spirit because the bride will come humble to this word because she knows that she and herself has no right to have that title. You're not born with an inherent right to have that title. It's the seed of God on the inside that gives you the right to, to bear that title. And it's God, it's not you. If God ever lifted his hand off of you and the spirit of God ever moved away from you, you would see how capable you are of controlling your flesh and how capable you are of living a Christian life. If he gave you one day 12 hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. where the spirit would pull right out of you and leave you to your own self, you would be desperate for him to come back because you would have no control over this animal that you live in. So there's no place for this arrogant attitude. Amen, we've got to come back and say, I am only what I am by the grace of God. And you can say, I am the bride of Jesus Christ. He gave me a revelation. There's no shame in saying, this is what I am. But I'm not that by me. I'm that by him. And I don't, the life that I live now, I don't live by myself. Amen. I live by the life of the Son of God who's come and lived in me. Praise be to God. That's a tactic of the devil to get us to play around with the word of God because of who we are. To exalt self over the word, to exalt ourselves and become proud and, and all of a sudden become uh, seemingly in our minds untouchable. I'm the bride. He doesn't want me to suffer. I'm the bride. 
He wants me to be happy. I'm the bride. Don't forget the scriptures that says if you want to reign with him, you have to suffer with him. Amen. Nonsense talk like, don't you think God wants you to be happy? You know what? I think God wants me to be right more than he wants me to be happy. Because true joy, true happiness is found in being aligned with the word and being connected with Christ. He's not worried about my emotion of happy. He's worried about my soul being right. Praise be to God. God is good. Amen. Amen. Going on in the same quote, uh, how can I overcome? No servant of God is a show off of himself or try to take God's power and show himself above somebody else. I love that quote. I love it. You remember Moses did that. Remember that? God gave him power to do whatever he wanted to do, made him a prophet. He walked down to that rock and he smote the rock the second time. That was against God's will. And God said, speak to that rock. Don't smite it again. You break all the type there. The rock is only going to be smitten once. But he spoke of the weakness of the word when he did that. That wasn't sufficient. The word was what was going on. The rock was the word, see? And the first time he smote the rock and the waters come forth and they got thirsty again. So now go back and speak to the rock. It was only smitten once. The insufficiency of the word, Moses testified to it. The word wasn't right. He had to be smitten again. So Moses went down there and smote the rock like that and said, come forth. Didn't come forth, so he smote it again. He said, come forth. I command you to come forth and the waters come. God said, come up here, come here. You glorified yourself. You took my power instead of the sanctifying me. You sanctify yourself. Now you're not going over in the land. Here's Moses. There was none like Moses. Moses was, the, was one of the greatest prophets of all time. Amen. God used him as a deliverer. God used him to bring his people to the border of the promised land. Give him his word. Amen. Moses was a great prophet. But because he exalted himself, he did not go over to the promised land because God is not playing games. Let's look at this in Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, and I want to read from verse 7. This is the same story. Numbers chapter 20, verse 7. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Uh oh. There's the problem right there. Was me. He was exalting himself and Aaron. And he was condemning the people. And he says, you rebels, must me. Hey, Moses had no power. It was the word of God that was going to bring forth water. It was because God commissioned it. God commanded it. God said so. And now he injects himself instead of sanctifying God. He says, Let's go back. He says, here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod. He smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Amen. Moses, he exalted himself in the eyes of the people, and he made himself the deliverer of water. 
He made himself the one who was able to bring water. Instead of pointing them to God, he pointed to himself. And I'll tell you, any time you see a ministry that keeps pointing people back to themselves, I have this gift and I have that gift and I'll teach you this and I'll tell you that and come to me for this, i tell you, we, we want to be pointing people to Christ and say, listen, the word says, amen, the word says, if we stick with the word, God will do. The word says, God does. God acts on his word. The word, I mean, that, that's the way we want to minister, friends. That's the way we want to live with one another. That's the way we want to encourage one another. Not say, wait till I get there, I'll come down there and I'll do this and I'll do that. You just hold on till I'll get there. We'll take care of this devil. No. You say, listen, let's stand upon the word and trust God to do what only God can do. Let's stay with what he gave us and trust him that this word will never fail. God's mighty. God's powerful. God's never failed to keep his word. God's never been defeated by any enemy. Leave yourself out of the picture and let it all be about him, his word, him working according to his word to deliver us. If we can get ourselves out of the picture and give all glory to God, amen, we'll see God come on the scene and do what he's always promised to do. Amen. Now he goes on in in the message, how can I overcome? He says, the third great assault, Satan offered to forfeit his kingdom to him. He did, Satan said, see these kingdoms of the world? These are mine. I do with them whatever I want to. I'll forfeit them to you. But remember, He was trying to get him to forfeit it without the cross. This is the third great assault. If he did, we'd be lost. He could have took the kingdom, but he must must come back. He must be, he was tempted to do it now. Death is a hard thing. He was tempted to take his liberty and be the king of the earth without the cross. But if he did, his subjects would have died. Satan would have gladly made that proposition with him. But he said, get behind me, Satan. He didn't do it. He came and suffered and took the hard, rugged route. He took the route of persecution. He took the route of death. Are we this morning willing to do to take the same route that he had taken? Are we willing to die? Are we willing to give ourselves up to God, forfeit all the world and the things to serve him? So what was the third great assault? The third great assault was to have Victory without sacrifice. He wanted to win the prize with no suffering. Win the prize with no sacrifice. And and in this Laodicean enchanted environment we live in, it's people's rights. And we don't want anybody to suffer. Nobody, we don't want anybody to have a bad day. So we panter to their emotions and we give in to their whims and we feed the flesh with all kinds of nonsense because people's happiness becomes the epitome of existence. And nobody seemingly has the capacity to suffer anything anymore. Nobody has endurance. I should say almost nobody because the Christ seed does. He tried to get Christ to bypass suffering. And I'll tell you, friends, you, you, you just hang on. The devil tries constantly to get us to bypass suffering. There, this word, the word way is a rugged way. The word path is a is a self-denying, difficult path to walk. It'll require personal sacrifice. It'll require death to self. It'll require laying down your emotions, amen, to follow after this word, amen, and that goes stark against, um, direct contrast to the Laodicean spirit, amen, but the spirit of Christ was willing to go through for the glory that lay ahead. He was willing to follow the word and deny himself and make a sacrifice out of himself and die out completely himself to stay with that word, and that brought the victory. 
What will bring overcoming in our lives when we will deny ourselves to stay with this word, when it cost us friends, when it cost us relationships, when it cost us peace, amen, when we get misunderstood and rejected for staying with the word, amen, nobody wants to suffer rejection, nobody wants to be misunderstood, everybody wants to be liked by everybody. And if you're not one of those people who want to be liked by everybody, then there's some disorder. Because everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be well thought of. Amen. But to take the word way is to take the word with the Lord's despised few. And the devil will try. One of his tactics in the temptation is try to get us to, to the prize without any personal sacrifice. To be the bride and get all the benefits of the bride, but never having to completely surrender and die to self to follow the word to get to the prize. He wants us to take the title of bride, pin it to ourselves, keep our old lusts and life and desires, and not completely die out to our own thinking and our own wants, amen, and call ourselves bride and have the prize without the sacrifice. I tell you, it does not work, amen? If you want to reign with him, you must suffer with him. You must be willing to lay it all down. And it means, what does it mean? It means rejection. It means misunderstandings. It means hurt feelings. It means criticism. It means harsh comments. Oh, you'll get every one of those because if you take the word, the word is so contrary to man's thinking. The word is so contrary to the modern era that we live in that people will think you're harsh, unloving, unflexible. You don't care. Has anybody been a Christian for very long? You know what I'm talking about. Your family won't understand why you raise your children this way. Yeah, yeah, the, the people that are around you, your neighbors and, and coworkers and friends, they, they'll, they'll, they'll criticize you for living the way you live. They'll mock you for not being entertained by the world and because you don't know what they're talking about when they're talking about what was on TV last night. When they're all laughing about something that's going around and trending on some social thing, uh, a social media thing or whatever it is, and you don't know b b about the latest trending two million views of a what, 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 I don't know. I don't even really know what I'm talking about. I'll show you how, <laughs> how good I am at this. But when you're the only one in the room who doesn't know what they're talking about, and they look at you like you're from outer space, I say, praise God, if that's the worst reproach we have to bear. I mean, that's shameful when we have to stand in the lineup of saints that have gone before. And, you know, Peter, he was crucified upside down. They tried to boil James alive and, and oil, and, and they stoned and beat Paul and finally cut his head off. And they say, what was it like for you? They made fun of me at work. But sometimes we can't even do that. Sometimes we can't even stand on the word because we don't want to be laughed at or made fun of or rejected by coworkers. Trying to get us to take the prize without sacrifice. Trying to tempt us, amen, to, to win the prize, be the bride, but not have to surrender all. One of the hardest things for us to lose is our reputation. We guard it, we protect it, we defend it. But listen, what good is your reputation? I want his reputation. I want to be aligned with him. I want to be known as Mrs. Jesus Christ, not whatever I was before. Let that reputation die, amen? Let what people think of that man die, amen? But it's what I think of him that matters. So he tried to get him to bypass, bypass suffering, bypass the cross, and take the prize and take the kingdom and rule as the king of the world with no suffering. He's gonna to try to get you and I to believe that we're queen that'll sit on that throne, never having had to be rejected, mocked, scorned, laughed at, never having to surrender our own wants and give up our own ideas and cut off relationships and separate 
from the world and throw things away and cut off entertainments. And we want to keep all of that and still be a son of God and still have a right to sit in this throne. That's a, that's a deception of the devil. But if I want to win that everlasting prize, God calls for total separation from all unbelief. Amen. Will it hurt? Yes. Will you be misunderstood? Absolutely. Will you win the prize? Yes. Amen. Will you care when you get to the other side? No. And one more quote here, he says, and, um, how can I overcome? He said, overcome how? By taking the word, the promise, and humility, humbly walking. How can I overcome? By taking the word, the promise, humbly walking. I want to turn to Daniel chapter 3 together, and I want to look just a couple examples as we wind down. Go to the book of Daniel. Book of Daniel, chapter 3. If we could turn there. This is the story of the three Hebrew men. I corrected myself from saying three Hebrew children. They were, they were children when they went to Babylon. This was some time later. And if you ever meet them on the other side, don't call them the three Hebrew children. They did grow up. So these are the three Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They have to face the trial of the, the king's religion and the king's idol. They want him to worship before it, and they refused. And now they're coming before Nebuchadnezzar in verse 14. It said, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. They're saying, we're not cautious, we're not anxious, we know exactly how to answer. We're not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship thy golden image which thou hast set up. I love this example because they're following the word. The word tells them that they're not to bow before graven images here in a foreign land, a powerful king, you know, and they're officials in the kingdom. These are people who have had benefit and privilege of having uh, an office and a position with the kingdom, with Nebuchadnezzar. Amen. They're not poor. They're not destitute. They're, they're living uh, uh, presumably a good life in Babylon. But now they come and face the word, and when they come in contact with the word and, and, a, and a law to move them contrary to the word, they refuse to bow. And Nebuchadnezzar gives them another chance, and he says, if you'll do, if you'll bow, amen, it'll be well. But if not, uh, you'll be thrown into the furnace, and what God will save you then? And they said, we're not careful to answer you, king. And I want you to catch the, the attitude that they have. This is what I want to highlight so well. They don't, they don't get brazen and bold. They don't start uh, spitting threats and say, you better not. If you know what's good for you, don't throw us in that furnace. Yeah. Right. They don't say, do you know who we are? Yeah. But, but when Brother Branham told us you overcome by taking the word and humility and humbly walk. This is what these three did. They knew where they stood on the word. They knew this was contrary to the word of God. And they were worshipers of almighty God. And they were not going to bow before the image. But they didn't have to stomp, yell, threaten. They didn't have to, they didn't have to uh, petition. They didn't have to do anything. They were standing on the word. They were already overcoming regardless of the results. 
They were overcomers by staying with the word. And they said, we don't know. God is able to deliver us out of the fiery furnace. And he's able to deliver us from you. He will deliver us from your hand. But even if not, like I can't guarantee your results. I don't know what God will do. I'm not in control of God. God's word is in control of me. I'm under the control of God's word. God is not under my control. Just because I'm standing on his word, I can't say God will do this and God will do that and you just wait and see and, and he, no. We have to keep God as God and ourselves as his subjects, amen, and stand on his word and know that yeah, God is more than able to deliver me and I believe he will deliver me from your hand. But even if not, we're not gonna bow because I'm staying with the word. If God never shows up, if I never get a tingly feeling, if there's no sensation, if there's no seeming deliverance, if all this trouble doesn't go away tomorrow, I'm still standing on the word, amen? Because I'm not in control of God. I'm only controlling my surrender to this word. God will do what God will do. He's able, I believe he will, but if he doesn't, I'm staying with the word. If we could just have that attitude, we're gonna see some amazing things because God will do what God will do, but God will share his glory with no one. He won't share it with a ministry, he won't share it with a man, he won't share it with a church. He'll get all the glory and he'll do it in such a way when you can come humble before him and say, God, I don't know the answer, I don't know the solution, I don't know how to fix this problem, but I know your word says and I'm standing right with your word and I know that you will honor your word. We've tried to figure out too many things. And we've made too many bold proclamations. God will this and God will that. That's not the example we see. When people start making bold proclamations in the Bible, usually they're the prophets of God and God had already showed them in a vision or told them that this is what will happen. Even Micaiah, Micaiah was brought before Ahab and Jehoshaphat, and he has, a, he has a different prophecy than the rest of the prophets, amen? And he's even reluctant to give it because they've already come and gave, given him a warning. They said, now listen, the messenger came to get Micaiah and said, this is what's been prophesied, and you just say the same thing. And Brother Benham said they were telling him, Brother Benham said they were telling him, if you want to get back in with the organization, with the denomination, you're an outsider, just go along with this and you'll be accepted back but he's only gonna stay with the word. But look how he comes in. He doesn't stomp in and start pushing himself around and making something special out of himself. He comes in, he knows what they want, he knows what Ahab wants, he knows where his heart is, and he says, what do you say? He says, go on up. That's what you wanna do anyways. It was only Jehoshaphat who really wanted to know what the Lord wanted, not Ahab. So he looked at Ahab and said, go on up. And he said, did I not tell you to only speak to me in the name of the Lord? And Micaiah says, go up, but I see Israel as sheep with no shepherd. He didn't start calling him names. He didn't start saying, do you know who I am? And Micaiah was just standing there. And then Ahab has him thrown in prison and on the way out he said, feed him bread of sorrow, feed him this and that. When I return, he says, if you return at all, God never spoke to me. Yeah. Right. Now listen, he never said, there's no chance that you're coming back because you know who I am. And look at the humility. Yeah. If you come back at all, God didn't speak to me. Yeah. Right. Look where he put himself. It wasn't arrogant, it wasn't brash, it wasn't harsh, it was just a man who was doing what God told him to do. It was just a man not exalting himself, but just exalting God and only, only saying what God told him to say. Not adding a bunch of stuff to it, not making himself a special person, just saying, if you do return, God never spoke to me. Praise God. I love the character that I see in the Bible, and I want that character to be in me. Let's go over to Daniel chapter six. Now, 
Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he knelt upon the knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he did aforetime. Daniel now, as, as one of the head presidents over all the realm of Darius and the Medes and the Persians, He's got other presidents that are jealous of him and princes, and they have Darius sign a decree that nobody else can worship anybody else but himself. Amen. And so, so, but Daniel, Daniel didn't go storming in to the king's chamber and complain. And listen who Daniel is. Daniel is the highest ranking of three presidents that he put over his entire kingdom. And he's the head of them all. And he was going to set the entire kingdom under Daniel. So Daniel's not like you and I trying to go to the wire house and talk to somebody. Knocking on the door. Can I have a meeting with the speaker of the house? Daniel, Darius was going to set the whole kingdom under Daniel's rule. He had the whole kingdom divided amongst three presidents, and Daniel was the leader of them all. He could have got an audience with Darius. He could have, he could have pleaded his case. He could have made a good case. Amen. No doubt he was wiser than them all. The reason he was exalted and God had given him supernatural wisdom, he could have made them look like fools, but he didn't do anything. This was, this was attacking the word of God and his worship to God. Amen. They were attacking God. So he just went and did what he always did. He didn't change his routine one drop. He said, when it was written and signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber. He didn't say, well, watch me. You say I can't. Listen, I tell you, you stay away from all this right wing news media garbage because they're, 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 they're messing up people's minds, making you violent and bold and brash, amen, to fight against this and fight against liberalism and fight against that, amen. Daniel even never made a protest to Darius. He just kept serving God the way he always served God. He didn't have to yell. He didn't have to storm around. He didn't have to start a petition. He didn't have to start a news media outlet. He didn't have to start blogs. All he did was went in and his windows already being open. You know, they didn't go to have a prayer vigil on the Capitol steps. He just did what he always did. And he prayed. And he prayed towards the east because that was the commandment that he was given. And Solomon in his prayer and the dedication of the temple asked God to hear every prayer. And Daniel believed it. And he went back to prayer, submitting to the word of God, humbly serving God, and never raising a fuss about it one drop. In verse 19 it says, they, they arrested him. The king could not change his decree. It was the laws of the Medes and Persians. He could not change. So he had Daniel thrown in the lion's den. Made a sleepless night for him, but he comes in the morning. In verse 19 he says, then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a uh, lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent an a- his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths, and they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. The question wasn't, Daniel, did you overcome? The question was, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you? And he said, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. It wasn't about Daniel, it was about God. It wasn't Daniel's victory. Daniel overcame by standing with the word. When he stood with the word, God stood with Daniel. God shut the mouths of the lions. God gave him victory, and God gave him the ability to overcome. Daniel couldn't have done anything to change his situation. What could the three Hebrew men do, amen, to keep themselves from being burnt in the fire? They had no power. They had no ability. They could not change their circumstance. Only God could deliver them from that circumstance. 
Daniel, there was nothing Daniel can do, and there was nothing Daniel tried to do. He just submitted himself, and if God wanted him eaten by lions, he would be eaten by lions. Listen, we do too much self-preservation, and we try to figure out what God wants too much and say, there's no way God would want this, and there's no way God would allow that, and God doesn't want me to go through this, and God doesn't want this to happen to me. Stop doing God's thinking for him and let God be God, and let God do his own thinking and make his own decision about what he'll do with you. You say, there's no way God would let that happen to me. How do you know? God let Daniel get thrown in the lion's den. He let his three Hebrew children. He let Jeremiah be thrown in a pit. He let Isaiah be sawn in half. He let Peter be hung upside down. He let Paul be beat, amen, with, with rods, beat with whips. He be stoned and left for dead. He let him be shipwrecked a couple times. He let him be chased from city to city. What do you mean God doesn't want that to happen to you? God won't let that to happen to you. He's let it happen to every other Christian that's come down through the ages. What do you mean you know God doesn't want th- that to happen to you? I know God doesn't want me to suffer this way. I know God doesn't want this to happen to me. How do you know? And how dare you say that you know what God's thinking? Just say, God, if this is what you want, then here I am. I can't deliver myself. I can't save myself. I can't change the circumstances. I'm totally, completely in your hands. I'll tell you, friends, if we could just stop taking things in our own hands and fall completely into his hands and let God work these things out. Stop assuming that we know what he wants. I know he wants this and I know he wants that. I was talking to another brother and I was sharing with him when I was preaching and he says, you know, he started referring to Brother Benham. Brother Benham is standing in the prayer line. He calls the prayer line. He advertises a healing meeting. He calls the prayer line. People are ready to come and he says, now, you know I'm waiting on something. Now, I can't say that he will come. I can't say that he will come. Listen, he had a commission from an angel to take a gift of healing to the people of the world. He was working in that commission, but even with an angel commissioning him to take a gift of healing to the peoples of the world, he still could not control God. He didn't say, God's gonna come on this pulpit in five minutes, God's coming down, you better run to this altar because God's gonna come and meet you at this altar. You never hear Brother Bam saying something like that. You never, you say, you see him humbly saying, now, I don't know that it'll come. I'm waiting. You know I'm waiting on something. Now, he's here. (laughs) He couldn't control God. All he could do was stay in the commission. All he could do was stay obedient. All he could do was be reverent, be humble, and be in his commission and do what the angel told him to do. God was gonna have to do the rest. Brother Bram said, I'm not the one that that tells you those things. It's him. I don't know you. You haven't touched me. You touched the high priest. He was leaving himself out of it as much as he possibly could. I don't know that'll come. Now he's come, Brother Bram said, he's met me here thousands of times. But he had no guarantee that he was going to meet him there again. He was just trusting that he would and acting in faith that he would. I want that attitude. I want to stop telling what God's going to do and just start controlling myself to line up to that word and trust God to do the rest. Will he deliver you? I don't know, but I believe he will. Amen. Will he deliver you of that sickness? I don't know. God has a plan, but I believe he will because I believe his word. And if God ever tells you that he has, supernaturally, you say, he's already healed me. It's done, it's finished, and get up and walk away. But if not, just take him on his word and say, by his stripes, I'm already healed, and just keep walking. How do you overcome? Take his word, take his promise, and humbly walk. Amen. Don't, Don't become the controller of God. And don't make God your servant who has to come at your beck and call. But become the servant of God that comes at his beck and call, that moves upon his word, his commandment, that surrenders to him and trust him to do the rest. 
He's done it for Moses. He did it for David. He did it for Daniel. He did it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He did it for Micaiah. He did it for Jeremiah. Why wouldn't he do it for you? We have to stay humble and surrender. Brother Bram says again, and how can I overcome? He says, Jesus told us how to do it. He overcome. Overcome means to stand the test. To stand the test. That's right. Like the old saints did, Jesus did amidst all of his enemies, he stood the test. Everything he was tested against, he stood it. In the very face of sickness and him being Messiah, he healed them. In the face of death, he brought it back to life. In the face of Calvary, his own death, he defeated it by surrendering himself. Why? By the word. He said, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. The word said so. And in the presence of death, he defeated it. He overcome death in the presence of hell. He defeated hell and overcome hell. Yes, in the presence of the grave, he overcome the grave. Why? All by the word and humility. Oh my, there's the real man. There's the one to make your example. He defeated everything. He overcome it. How did he overcome it? By the, by the word and humility. We've talked many times about him standing and and in the court, a pilot standing on trial, a mockery of a trial, and he stood there silent because he knew it was the will of God. And even when Pilate slipped up and said, you know I have power to save your life and I have power to take your life, and all Jesus said was, you, the only power you have is what's been given to you from above. So if you have power to take my life, it's because God gave it to you. Can we believe the same thing? If you have power to take my life, it's given to you from above. If you have the power to throw me in jail, it's given to you from above. If you have the power to arrest me and imprison me, it's given to you from above because I'm in the hands of God and I belong to God. I'm not my own. I've been bought by a price. I belong to him. And if he sees fit that I need in this journey to spend some time here or there or in this situation, what am I going to do to change it? but I'm gonna stand on the word and keep believing him and I'm going to overcome by believing the word and staying with the word. Brother Branham in this message, how can I overcome? He begins to talk about the pond lily. And Brother Branham talks about the pond lily in so many different sermons and he talks about there was a pond lily in the little pond that they drained where they built the, the tabernacle, where Branham Tabernacle set. There was a little pond and he always went by and he, he admired the pond lily. It was one of his favorite plants and, uh, one of his favorite flowers, and he begins to talk about how it comes out of the muck under the dark, dank uh, 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 pond, under the stagnant waters, in the muck, laying in the mud at the bottom, but it begins to climb its way to the light until it breaks forth out of the water, amen, and it begins to bloom, and he said, it's so beautiful after it blooms, you couldn't imagine where it started from. And he starts to type this to the believer, and he says, he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world. Now, if you look back, you're condemned when you're still in the world, but if you're living above that, then he that's in you has led you above the darkness. Like the lily, he's above the darkness of the mud. He's above the darkness of the muddy waters. He's in the light, reflecting the beauty that was put in him before he left the mud. Down in the mud, in the seed was a beauty that he had to reflect. It was already there when he was down under the water, buried in the mud. There was already a beautiful lily on the inside of that seed, but it had to go through the process of climbing towards the sun, moving towards the word of God. And as it moved, it began to become more like what it was on the inside, and it began to reflect what was down inside of it. And it came into the picture and image of a lily. Then it popped out, and in the face of the sun, it began to reflect what was inside of it already. And he types that with you and I as the believer, and he said, you cannot look back, amen, to where you came from. Anytime you look back to the mud and the muck and the mire we came from, you get condemned, but you can only look to where you're going, amen? Only look to what you're pointed to. We all came from all kinds of situations, from mud and muck, but inside the seed that was in the mud and the muck was something that God wanted to display, the reflection of his beauty. And it was already there. So don't look back at the muck. Look, look at the sun and keep climbing to the sun and following that word. And as that word comes to manifestation, it'll bring all the life that was trapped in that seed 
out. He begins to type this with the believers we've been talking about in the Old Testament. He says, now I feel like a shouting Christian. What was it there by God at the beginning? It pressed its way through, overcome. It overcome the shell. It overcome the mud. It overcome the waters. It overcome everything. It was an overcomer and reflecting the beauty and glory of God. How did that lily overcome? There was a life trapped down inside that when sun hit it, it began to move towards the sun, towards the word. How did it overcome? Kept moving towards the sun. How will we overcome? Keep moving towards the sun. Stay with the word. Move towards the word until the word produces what's already inside of you, comes out to reflect the life that was trapped inside. What do I do to overcome? Keep walking in the word. And become what you were always meant to become. He said it, it overcome everything. It was an overcomer and reflected the beauty and glory of God. That's the way every believer does. That's the way Noah did. That's the way Lot did. That's the way, look what a mess he was in. That's the way Moses did. That's the way Joshua did. That's the way Daniel did. That's the way Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. That's the way John the Baptist did, Zacharias, Elizabeth. That's the way Simeon, that's the way Anna, every one of them did. They overcome the mud that they were around them and packed into them, stuck their head above the thing and shined forth the glory of God. That's what a real Christian does. What do I do? Just keep stretching towards the light. Just keep moving. How did little little Lily overcome? Buried in mud, buried in the pond. How? It had no chance, amen, of ever being anything buried that deep below the surface of the water and in the mud, except there was a seed inside. And the word, the light began to pull it. And what you and I are to become was in us, in our soul, from before the foundation of the world. And the light of the word is begin to pull us, keep walking in the light. We don't have to figure out how it's gonna happen, how will I get to this, how will I overcome that? Stay with the word, our overcoming is in the word. Stay with the word, stay in the light, God will take care of the rest. Remember Joshua now, Joshua is now commissioned to carry the children of Israel over Jordan and into the promised land. And they've already got spies that went in some 40 years before and warned everybody. Joshua's already been in there. He's seen the walled cities. He's seen the giants. He's seen the armaments. He's seen it all. And now he's standing at the banks of Jordan. And now it's his job to cross Jordan and to go into the promised land but he's got no idea how to get this army across that river. But God provides a way. He's in the line of duty, but he doesn't know how to do it. He could try, you know, manufacturing some sort of planking system and a a bridge, but God's already got a plan. If it just holds steady and wait, God has a way across. And then they come to the first big city of Jericho. Amen. Brother Branham said they could have chariot races around the walls. They were so thick. Amen. There was no way that they could take it down. But God said, just just walk around it once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, go around it seven times. Hey, you know, I'm no general. I'm no architect. I'm nothing but... There's no way that walking around a building is going, or walking around a city is going to bring the walls down. He realized the plan that God gave him, the word that God gave him, didn't seem sufficient to take care of the obstacle that was ahead. The obstacle was a walled city impenetrable with no way to get over it, no way to get through it, but yet they had to take it out to go to the rest of the promised land. And the word that God gave them to overcome that obstacle seemed completely insufficient. You have a walled city, What I want you to do is go take the army and walk around it and be real quiet. Don't say anything. And then what? Nothing. Just go back to camp. The next day you walk around it and be real quiet. And then what do we do? Nothing. Go back to camp. Six days. Seventh day, walk around it seven times. And on the last time, blow the trumpets and have everybody shout for the mastery, for the victory. Okay, we'll do it. You realize... There was no logical explanation in the commandment to explain how they were going to get into that city. 
But it wasn't Joshua's responsibility to figure out how the walls were going to come down. It was Joshua's responsibility to keep the word of God. Sometimes we wonder, you know, how is it that doing all of these things that God told us to do, how will it help me overcome this situation or that situation? It's not us to figure out how the walls are going to come down and how deliverance will come. God will take care of that. The three Hebrew men, they couldn't figure out how they were going to be delivered. Daniel didn't know how he was going to be delivered. No, uh, Moses didn't know how they were going to get across the Red Sea. He nobody knew how they were going to do it. All they knew was the word that they were given, and they walked according to that word. And when they walked according to that word, God provided the deliverance. God has given us his word in this day, amen, and we're constantly trying to solve our own problems and figure out how to overcome these obstacles. What we need to do is back up and just say, God, I'm standing with the word that you gave through a prophet. I'm doing all that you told me to do, and I'm trusting you to do the rest, and I don't know how you'll do it. I can't even envision how you'll do it, so I have no suggestions. Because you know what happens if you suggest something in prayer and then God does it that way. You said, I said in prayer. And we exalt ourselves again. But it's better to come and say, God, I have no answers. I have no way around this. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. But I'm standing on your word and I've done, as far as I know, I've done everything that your prophet told me to do. And I'm staying as faithful as I know how to stay to your word. And now I'm trusting you to bring deliverance, to bring healing, to bring whatever we need. Amen, I'm trusting you to do it. That's the approach that I wanna have. I wanna read one more scripture out of Exodus, let's turn together to Exodus 14. And we'll finish with this. Exodus 14. Exodus 14 and 13. They're out of Egypt marching to the promised land, going out singing and dancing and rejoicing. And they hit their first obstacle, which is the Red Sea. And then Pharaoh sends his army out after them to destroy them. And they begin to panic and they begin to get excited and they begin to chastise Moses and say, why have you let us out here? This is not what we told you. Let us stay in bondage with the Egyptians lest we die in the wilderness. And Moses responds before God speaks anything to him. Moses responds and says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. And the Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Stand still. What I want to say is Moses didn't have the solution yet. He just knew what God had told him, that he was going to bring them to this land, that they were going to go worship on that mountain. He didn't know the solution. He didn't know how yet. God hadn't told him to take the rod and hold it up. All he knew was that God would not fail on his word that we're to go worship on Mount Sinai. But he knew that he didn't have power to deliver them, and he did not have the solution to the problem, but he knew who did. And he says, verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. When you've done all that God asked you to do and you still have no answers, don't make up answers. Don't pretend that you know what to do when you don't know what to do. Don't become so bold that you start making declarations that God didn't tell you to do and you have no permission to do. Just stand and say, God, you've called me to this life. You've called me to this word, and I'm standing on this word, and I'm in the line of duty. And, Lord, I'm trusting you to fight for me and to deliver me. I'm going to hold my peace until I see what you do, and then I'm going to be on the other side of the Red Sea with a tambourine singing and dancing and talking about the great victory that you just brought because I didn't even know what to do. We got family situations, we have personal situations, work situations, all kinds of situations that we don't have the solution to, but what we've been given is the word and the word is enough and if we'll stand with the word and have faith in God and stand still, 
and watch God fight for us and have confidence in him, I believe we'll see the hand of God over and over and over again. What's the way to walk? Stay with the word and walk humbly. And let's all stand. Musicians, if you could come, please. And Brother Ben, if you'll come forward, please. I don't know why God will not give me permission to leave this subject, submission and humility and surrender. Amen. But there's a reason, friends. There's a reason. It's a constant every Wednesday and every Sunday for several weeks now, a reminder that if you want to go up, you must go down. If you want something from God, you must surrender to him. That it's, he's not looking for an arrogant, bold nature. He's looking for a humble, submissive nature so that he can be the great one among us. I said, God, help me. Help me to forsake all my thinking and just trust in you. Amen. Praise God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, for your word for the things that your prophet has taught us, Lord, and the wiles and the trappings of the devil and the temptation and how we always use those three, those three methods, Lord. Help us to guard against it by staying with your word. God, forgive us, Lord, for our wanderings. Forgive us for taking things in our own hand and coming up with our own solutions. I'm sorry, God. And I just pray, Father, that you would help us to walk humbly before you, to surrender ourselves to your word, to stay with the word, and have confidence that you will work the supernatural, the miraculous, that you will be powerful and you will be our deliverer. For we have complete confidence in you, so much so that we can lay ourselves in your hand and take our hands off and know that you'll do better than we could. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. May it live inside of us. May it change us. May we become more like you every day. May we handle situations the way you would handle them. May we respond the way you responded, Lord. May we be obedient the way you were obedient and submissive the way you were submissive and humble like you were humble. For God, you're looking for a bride to reflect your character. That we might be on this earth all that you were and all that you are. Help us, God, to surrender. We love you and we thank you for helping us. We ask that you would bless us now. As we go from here, Lord, I pray that you bless our fellowship we'll partake of in a few minutes. May we encourage one another in the word and in fellowship, Lord. May we, may we boost one another up and love one another. May we go out of here encouraged, Lord, in the word to keep walking, Lord, to be an overcomer, to obtain all of the promises by overcoming. Help us, Lord, I pray. We surrender to you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. We remind you of the fellowship immediately after the service in the fellowship hall. It sounds like it's going to be wet outside, but we'll just pack in and have a close fellowship in the fellowship hall. God bless you all. Let's sing. We And I was thinking about the Hebrew, the Hebrew men, the fiery furnace, and Daniel, Jeremiah, and Micaiah, and Isaiah, David, and Moses. And I was thinking of all of them, and then I was thinking of Jesus Christ, and Paul, and his trial, and his arrest, and his trial. And one thing you notice in all of these men is they don't get excited. There's no record in the Bible that they were fearful and running around and going from person to person to try to 
get an answer and get help and get support. You don't see where they were anxious and nervous and <clears throat> they knew God was going to take care of them. They knew who they were and they knew who God was and that was enough. I was like, that's what I want. I don't want to face every situation and get nervous and run around and try to get a solution from somebody and an answer from somebody. I just want to know who I am and I want to know who God is and I want that to be enough. I want to know that I, I, I am his child and I've surrendered to him and I'm living the life he's called me to live and trusting that he'll do everything else so that I don't have to get nervous or fearful. Amen. Moses was the first one that says, fear ye not. Don't be afraid. The Egyptians are coming. The Red Sea is here. I don't have the answer, but don't be afraid. Where are we going to go? I don't know. How will we survive? I don't know. Well, I, I don't see. There's cliffs here. There's water here. There's an Egyptian army here. It looks like imminent death. But, but Moses at that time says, fear ye not. Don't be afraid. And I want to get to that place to have that much confidence in God to not only know who God is, but know who I am in Christ and say, I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to do something. And whatever he does, it's going to be amazing. And I'm going to give him all the glory. Let's be confident. Let's be, let's have some peace about us and not get anxious and nervous every time something goes wrong, but relax and say, God has always been God and he's always saved his people. This isn't his first day on the job and I'm not his first child. I can relax and trust in him and let him solve all of my problems. Amen. Let's act like we're growing up in the Lord. Let's act like we're maturing in the word. Let's act like the believers of old. Let's be the believers of today. Amen. God bless you. Let's sing as you're dismissed. We have
He's got 
just keeps holding me.